Right, so in the previous um, video, we looked at how we can build an operating system that can switch between multiple processes to create the illusion that they're running at the same time. And we saw with the demo we've got here, we had this model that enabled us to conceive how we had different processes running at the same time. So we always have one that's running, and we can have other processes, other programs that are either blocked, waiting for something to happen from the operating system, say waiting for user input, or network I.O., or disk I.O., or something. And we can have others that are ready to run, but are just waiting. If you watch the other video, we can see that we can then switch the ones that are running to be runnable and so on, so that we can then get another one running. And if we do that fast enough, we do it, say, every 200th of a second, we can give the illusion that these processes are all running at the same time. And occasionally they become unblocked and they can then be ready to be runnable until one of them finishes. I noticed somebody put a comment on a previous video saying, would it be possible to go directly from create to runnable? Um, yes, and in fact, that's probably what you would do. If you look at the source code for Unix, say, then yeah, when the process is created, it does end up being runnable, but it's put in a position so the next time you context switch, which is what we're going to look at today, it will um, become running and so on. We said when we looked at this video that there's three things we need. We need this model so we know how we're going to switch them and which ones we can switch and so on. We need a way of knowing which process we're going to move from runnable to running at which point in time. And the final thing we need is some physical way that we can make the CPU stop running one program and then start running the other. And that's what we're going to look at today. It's called what's called context switching because we're switching from the context which one program's running to switching to the context that another program is running. So to understand how context switching works, we need to think about how our CPU executes programs. So let's actually have a look at a very simple program. I'm going to write it using ARM machine code because the context switching does happen at the machine code level, it doesn't happen higher up as we use a, a higher level language. So let's think about a very simple program that is going to load in a string. I'm going to use ARM machine code for this example. So we're going to load in the address of a string into R0, so let's call this hstring. And then we're going to print it out. And I use a development environment for developing our machine code, which is written at the University of Manchester, which allows me to call the equivalent of the operating system using SWI3 to print something out. So that's going to print something out, and we'll define hstring up here to have a hello world in it. And then let's do something else. Let's print out all the numbers from 1 to 10. So we'll move into R1, the value of 0, and then we'll start a loop. We're going to add R1, comma, R1, comma, 1. We shall move that into the register R0, and then we'll call another pseudo operating system function to print out an integer. So we're adding 1 to the value we've put in there, so it goes from 0 to 1, because we've added 1 onto it. We then move into another register, and then we call the operating system to print it out. We'll then compare our value in R1 with 10, and we'll branch if it's less than 10. So we'll branch if it's less than 10 to loop. And then we'll print out something else here. So again, we set R0 to point to our string, and we'll call this I string if we want to have a better name. And we'll call out so I3 dot 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 dot, and that'll be the rest of the program. So we've got a, a simple ARM machine code program here. We'll just use ARM for the example. We could do exactly the same on a x86 AMD 64 chip. We could do exactly the same on a 68000 chip, a 6502. It doesn't matter. We're just using ARM as an example. So we've talked about this before on Computer File, but the way this program works is that every time we execute instruction, somewhere inside the CPU, this was probably even worse to see, we have a set of registers, R0, R1, R2, and so on. And these can just store a temporary value. So as we run through the program, this one says, put the address of H string in R0. So we work out what it is, and we write a value in there. Then we call this, and this calls off into our pseudo operating system, and we'll print out whatever it is that it's doing. So it'll use that value and probably manipulate the registers. We then come to the next line, which moves the value of 0 into there. And then we come to the next line, which gets the value out of the register R1, which is 0. Adds 1 onto it, which is uh, 1. Yep. And then stores the result back in R1. We now have the next line, which gets the value R1, which is 1, one and stores it in R0, moves it into R0. We then call swipe 4 which prints it out. We come here, we compare R1, which is 
one yeah. with 10, it's less than. So we go around the loop and then we do the same. We get the value of our one, which is one. We add one to it, which is two, and we update the value. So we've now got two in our one. So that's the model that our CPU runs the program. And to understand how context switching is, we need to remember that this instruction only ever looks at the value of R1. We're interested in this yellow instruction here. For it to work, the only thing it needs is the value that's currently in R1. It doesn't care how that value got there. It could have got there because we've moved zero into it here, which is what happens the first time, or it could have got there because we've added one into it previously. It doesn't make any difference to the operation of that instruction. As long as the value of R1 has the same value in, then it will do exactly the same thing. So if it has a value of 1 in it, it will always add 1 and become 2. If it has a value of 0 in it, it will always become 1 and that store 1 in it. So, so it doesn't matter how it got there. And that is the key to understanding how context switching works. What happens when we context switch is we have one program running and it's executing lots and lots of different code to make things happen. And at some point, that program gets interrupted, either because it's called the operating system or because there's an interrupt in the computer which has hit the operating system and the operating system says, OK, you've had enough time on this. I'm going to switch to something else and things that we talked about briefly in the previous video. Let's say we are here. We've got to this point in our program. We've got an interrupt happening here and we're going to context switch. Now, the operating system, when it context switches, needs to make sure that when it comes back here, this program continues as if nothing had happened. So just so that we can be absolutely clear on this. So when you say context switching, this is switching jelly babies in our previous. Yeah, so this is switching from one program running to the other program running. So we're going from this one to this one and then back to this one as if nothing had happened when this one had run. So we need to switch from this one. So this is the first one and we're going to start running this one. So at this point, we need to store the state or the context of this program so that we can then, after we've run this one, switch it back to running this program instead. And this can continue as if nothing had happened. And as we've seen, the reason we can do that is because as long as the values in our registers have exactly the same values, and as long as the value in memory have exactly the same values, then the program will continue to execute in the same thing. Each of these instructions only depends on the values on the registers, not how they got there. So all we need to do is make sure whenever we switch from one program to another, that we keep track of the state of the program its context, so that when we come to load a different one, we can switch in its state and it will carry. So how do we go about storing the state of the program? Well, we need to store certain things. We need to store the value of the registers and any other state that is responsible for keeping the program running. Now, things in memory we can hide quite easily. Modern operating systems support virtual memory, and so we can just map one process's memory out and map another process's memory in, so that preserves the state of the memory very easily. The more involved part, it comes in storing the state of the registers and storing the state of the CPU. But actually that ends up being relatively straightforward. What we do is we have a process control block for each process in our operating system. And as part of that, we store the values of the registers and a few other things in there. So if we start off by having a look at our process control block, we have a register pointing to that and we can use R13 for this. Then we'll point into it at a certain point. Now, the thing about the ARM chip is that to make interrupts fast, it actually has registers that can overlay other registers. So I'm using R13 here, but this is the register that exists in supervisor mode inside the CPU. It's not the same register that we use when we're writing our code that runs in user mode. We talked about that in another video. So the first thing I'm going to do is store multiple registers into memory at the address pointed to by R13. And I'm actually going to take all the registers R0 through R14. So I'm dumping the registers into memory. So these get written in here, R0, R1, and that's just copying the values in. And that's just RAM, is it? That's just, that's just normal RAM that's been allocated as part of the operating system. We're calling this bit, we've set things up, so we're pointing at that. But we need to be careful because the state of our CPU isn't just stored in the registers that we can access. It's another register, the status register, which contains the flags that decide whether we can branch because if things have been compared and they're equal or not equal or less than or greater than. So we also need to store that. The way we do that is we move that status register into R0 like so. So we're copying that register into there and then we can store that into memory below here. So we're storing again 
relative to R13, the value of R0, which is now the value of the status register, so that goes in below where we were before, and also the value in R14, which because of the way the ARM processor works, will be the return address of our program, or where we want to continue running from. So we store that in there. What do we want to do next? Well, next we want to get the process control block of the next process we want to do. And the way that ARM suggests you do that is that you load R13 with the value in memory pointed to by the register R12. Again, that would have been set up by something else. And then you add four on to the end so that you're then pointing at the next process. Probably want to check here that you're not pointing at a null pointer because if you are, things would crash. And so if we're not, then what we do is we load multiple registers, LNDMDB, if not equal to zero, from R13, which we've now pointed up. But remember, we're still pointing at the same thing. Actually, we're pointing down here now. So we load them back into R0 and R14. We then move back into the status register that we had before. We'll just simplify things a bit for the point of this video, the value in R. So we're setting the status register back up. And then we move the registers that were at or R13 back into R0, sorry, to R14. But of course, these are the registers from the other process because we changed here which process we're pointing at. And the last thing we need to do is we just need to wait a bit. So we run an instruction which doesn't do anything. And we then set up the program counter. So we move into the program counter the value which we put in R14, but because of the way the pipeline works on the ARM CPU, we have to subtract four. And so if we execute that block of code, we can preserve the contents of the current process, copying its registers and its status register, that's the important bit, and then load in the value of the previous program's status register and values. So then we can just go back to our program and continue running our instructions as if nothing had happened because all the registers have the same values, all the memory addresses have the same value, and the status register, of course, which we didn't have before, also has the same value. Now, for an instruction like this, preserving the status register wouldn't have made any difference, but if our switch had happened here after the compare instruction, then if that got corrupted, then the branch wouldn't do as we'd expect. So context switching is relatively easy to implement. You just have to preserve all the registers of one process and then load back in the preserved registers for the new process. Same thing can be done to start a new process. We just set up a dummy process control block, which contains empty values for those registers, zero say, and then we can just load it in and move it from runnable back to running to get things started. So that's the sort of mechanics about how we save one process and then move in another one. The only other thing we need to do is decide when we do this. Because that's where things get slightly trickier. So we said that there's two places we could do it. We could either do it when an operating system call is made, i.e. when the user asks the operating system to do something, we could then make a switch. And that's relatively straightforward. The operating system gets to the end of whatever it was it was doing for the process, and it can then make a context switch so it moves to the different process. So we can just execute the code like that and do that, and that's fine. The other time we can do it is by using an interrupt. And what we do is we set up the hardware of our system, and this can either be a dedicated hard piece of hardware which generates this interrupt, or the, some CPUs enable you to do that on the actual CPU itself to generate an interrupt at a regular piece of time because the circuitry has all got integrated into the system. We set up that interrupt to happen regularly, let's say every 200th of a second. And when that fires, we can stop whatever process is running because we're now in the operating system code, so it can execute the context switch to stop it running and then move in to another process and it will continue as is. The only time you have to be careful is that if you're actually running operating system code at that point when the interrupts happen, you probably don't want to switch out in the middle of an operating system call. So probably what you do in that situation is defer it until the operating system call had finished and then switch at that point, otherwise you get some weird things happening which you might be halfway through setting up the network to listen for something and then you switch out and things could get slightly corrupted. So you have to be slightly careful when you do it. What happens when a program relies on, say, time or the clock? How does that work? I mean, is that something you just have to factor into your code or...? Ah, so, so for example, if you wanted a program that, say, was drawing a real-time clock on screen, how do you make sure that? Well, this again comes down to things about scheduling, which we'll look at in another video, is that you probably want certain programs